Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar here, part of our GC Advantage series where, where we bring in our advisors and they invite their special guests to uh, help everyone out there be a bit more productive in what they're doing. Today, we have a great topic. I, I couldn't be more thrilled with who we have here today, um, talking about competitors and how they would work together as, as general counsel. And it's just a, a really terrific group that we have here. Nancy, are we gonna forward these? Yeah, okay, so um, one, one of the things about the, uh, our series, as everyone should know already, um, in a week or two, the webinar will be available online. Uh, feel free to come and take another look at it, especially if you have to scoot out early. Um, also, refer your friends and colleagues to it. It's, uh, it's available for this webinar and obviously all of our previous webinars. Coming up, we actually have um, really two terrific webinars. Um, one with uh, Helen Pudlin, balancing the roles of business partner and manager of legal risk which is going to be a great topic. Helen has some terrific guests. And then Michelle Banks, who almost everyone knows out there, Michelle is gonna be leading women in law discovering the true meaning of success. So two, uh, two great webinars on our horizon. As far as questions go, if you scroll down on your screen, you'll see a Q&A feature. Um, instead of using the chat feature, I recommend you use the Q&A feature. Uh, Noah and Josh are going to try to uh, answer questions along the way, make this a bit more collaborative. Um, and if we don't get to it during that, we're gonna have a few minutes at the end for a bit of a Q&A. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the uh, presentation. And then uh, at last, I have the honor and privilege, one of our great advisors who I always felt so um, proud and fortunate to have in our, in our Barker Gilmore organization, uh, Noah Hamp, who was the former general counsel, corporate secretary, and chief franchise integrity officer of MasterCard. And I'll let Noah introduce his guest, which I think is just terrific. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. And, and thank you all for attending today. We look forward to having a, a, a fun discussion on what I think is an interesting topic and really look forward to your uh, questions and interaction. Uh, Josh, uh, just take, a, if you would, a couple of minutes and, and talk a bit about your background. Sure. Thanks, Noah. And it's a real pleasure to participate here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I took a bit of a non-traditional route to the general counsel role because I was not a transactional lawyer. I was a litigator um, and an antitrust lawyer, and I had done a number of lawsuits for Visa. Um, and I got a call uh, asking if I would come interview for the job. And I told the uh, directors that I wasn't right for the job. I, I, I don't have the transactional background. And they said, actually, Josh, you're exactly what we need. And the reason is, as Noah knows very well, uh, Visa and MasterCard had just settled at that time, I think the largest uh, domestic antitrust cases of all time. And uh, they were looking for a way to navigate through the, uh, the antitrust minefield. And so, uh, they persuaded me to leave private practice and join Visa, uh, which I did, I think, in 2004. Um, I started as general counsel of Visa USA, and Visa at the time was sort of like the United Nations. We had a bunch of loosely confederated bank associations, and I was asked to uh, be the lead lawyer for the U.S. entity. Um, and it quickly became apparent to me, at least from a legal perspective, that we ought to try to change our structure. Um, and uh, when we did that in 2008, I became general counsel of the global visa entity. So that's, that's my background, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. So, so uh, like, like Josh, I, I also have a, a, a non-traditional background for a general counsel. I, I actually started as a criminal defense lawyer and uh, then worked briefly for an IP law firm. And then back, I hate to admit it, but 1984, I answered an ad in the New York Law Journal for a position at a financial services company uh, calling for IP and Regulation Z uh, experience. I didn't know what Reg Z was, but <laughs> I walked my way into the job. 
and was there for almost 30 years. Um, so, um, and then um, just to round, uh, finish it off, I, I left um, MasterCard uh, to become the CEO of the uh, International Institute of Conflict Prevention and Resolution known as CPR. And that kind of launched my career into um, mediation and arbitration, which I do today under the Acumen ADR platform. Uh, Josh and I are going to talk about a topic that I don't think has really been discussed a whole lot, and, 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 and that is the relationships between general counsels, um, in, um, particularly in competitive industries. And I think we both share uh, a common view that's not necessarily consistent with the traditional view. Uh, the traditional view, I, I would say, is especially in competitive industries, for general counsels to approach each other with a degree of mistrust, um, even you might say as enemies, uh, especially where there's ongoing litigation or disputes. And particularly, I'd say in an industry like the payments industry that we were in, where we're really competing for the very same customers. So as we will discuss, and it'll become clear, um, we have the view that it's, 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 um, it can actually further the success of companies by having a relationship of collaboration and trust with their general counsels, which can actually kind of permeate through the company if handled property, properly. And now I'm sure all of you are thinking, oh my God, what about the antitrust issues? And we're gonna, we're gonna go over that because they obviously have to be navigated very carefully. But I, I think uh, to start, I think it'd be helpful for us to give um, the folks a little background about our industry. Josh, I'm sure you had some of the same experiences as I did, where folks at a dinner party or wherever would come up to you and say, oh, you work for Visa, can you help me with my credit card? So maybe uh, talk a little bit about the difference, the different role that MasterCard and Visa play as opposed to the banks that are their customers. I have been to a lot of those dinner parties and there is a misconception about what Visa and MasterCard do. I'll tell you what we don't do. We don't issue cards to consumers, nor do we acquire transactions for merchants. Those functions are done by the banks who are our customers. Um, what Visa and MasterCard are is technology platforms and networks, which provide connectivity between the different uh, participants in the payments ecosphere. So you have obviously cardholders, you have merchants, you have financial institutions, and then you have a whole bunch of companies sort of sometimes in the middle that handle the processing for those various uh, transactions. So what Visa and MasterCard do is we provide a common set of rules of the road um, so that everyone has certainty that when they use a card, it's going to be honored. And a merchant knows that when they accept a card, they're going to get paid. So, um, you know, some people have referred to the market that MasterCard and Visa operate in as a two-sided market. From the, from the very beginning of the industry, and this will really get us into, I think, um, one of the reasons we've, um, uh, MasterCard and Visa have confronted so many legal challenges. Uh, from the beginning of the industry, it was recognized that um, the one side of the business, the issuing side, has significantly more costs than the merchant side. The issuing side has to deal with uh, credit losses, fraud, and processing costs. So there is really a, an imbalance in the cost structure so that there was a need to having some sort of a, a transfer fee where the money, certain dollars would go from the merchant side of the business to the issuing side of the business. And, and that became uh, referred to as the interchange fee. And it is that fee that has really led to literally decades and decades of battles that have taken many different forms and have really um, caused both MasterCard and Visa and frankly the, the banks and the retailers to spend a tremendous amount of time and focus, and it's been the subject of much controversy over, over the years. And Ma uh, MasterCard and Visa, interestingly, don't pocket a penny of those fees, right, Josh? It's, it's, you know, we were in the midst of these battles 
and we uh, didn't really have dollars at stake because the you know the the merchant banks would want uh, lower fees for their retailers who generally paid the fee because it was passed on to them, and the issuing banks would want higher fees uh, because that was money that you know they kept. So we we were kind of in the middle of this what we refer to as as a four party system. Um, that was just, so, so mask on visa, as we've alluded to, have had significant legal challenges. They, they've taken the form of uh, challenges to interchange fees. We also dealt with lots of issues involving who, what types of businesses could use our, our network. It became controversial. For example, if there was hate speech and contributions over the mask on visa networks and the like. But the other, the other area of challenge that we faced for a number of years related to card issuance and the concept of duality. And that's the ability of banks to issue both MasterCard and Visa cards. But back since the 1970s, uh, banks had the ability to choose between MasterCard and Visa or issue both. And most of them saw it as an opportunity to get more customers if they could issue both brands. And they did. And uh, business went along on that, on that um, on that basis for many years. And then in the, I think it was the 1990s, Josh, when American Express decided they wanted to be able to sign up banks to issue their brand. And that led to uh, a, 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 like a significant number of battles that ultimately led to uh, Department of Justice litigation against MasterCard and Visa. Uh, it led to private litigation. It led to legislative battles and, and, and the like. And um, I, I, won't, I won't go into all the details of the litigation because we could spend the full hour on that. But um, the, the essence of the challenge that MasterCard and Visa uh, faced, and Josh alluded to that, was really the structure that because MasterCard and Visa were basically a conglomeration of financial institutions, the courts and, and plaintiffs could view them as acting as a single entity. Uh, sometimes it was referred to as walking conspiracies. So we both organizations needed to address, address that structure where the situation was that financial institution owned essentially 100% of both, owned, controlled, and governed. So Josh, I'm gonna ask you to talk about how Visa, and, and you can speak from MasterCard as well, how we, how we ultimately addressed uh, the legal attacks uh, and, and, and really changed the structure of the, of the business. Well, I think what we did know is we were fighting the good fight in one uh, battlefield. And then we changed the battlefield um, to give ourselves a better chance and a better advantage to ward off these antitrust claims that, that you alluded to. You know, I grew up um, with a mentor named Larry Popofsky uh, at my old firm, Heller Ehrman. And Larry uh, is sort of an antitrust legend and he, litigated GTE versus Sylvania, and um, he litigated a case called Nabanco, which had to do with Visa and MasterCard being, um, as Noah said, uh, claimed to be a, a walking conspiracy because Visa and MasterCard were not traditional corporations. They were membership associations where the banks were not only our customers, but they were our owners and they were our governors. And so when uh, the Visa board or the MasterCard board would set the fee, the interchange fee, you had these clever plaintiff's lawyers saying, aha, well, that's a, that's a per se price fixing case, or if it's not a per se case, it's illegal. And what uh, Larry Popofsky did in the Banco was establish a precedent that no, these joint ventures, which is what we were, when they do something, you don't look at it as a per se violation. You have to figure out under the rule of reason whether the pro-competitive aspects of it outweigh the anti-competitive aspects of it. And we both argued that, hey, unless you had a uniform price, it wouldn't work because otherwise the big banks would get, uh, they'd, they'd pay less, the small banks would pay more and you wouldn't have the certainty of obligation. Well, that worked for a while. Um, and then um, we both had pretty big hits. I think uh, MasterCard 
if I'm right, Noah paid a billion dollars to Walmart and company and, and Visa paid $2 billion because we were a larger uh, player at the time. Um, and the board said, hey, wait a minute, we can't go on like this. And so I can tell you from my shop, um, since I was uh, very conversant with all this, almost immediately when I came in, I started talking to the governance committee of our US board, which was led by a great uh, gentleman named Richard Davis, who was the CEO of US Bank, that, hey, you know, this is very lucrative for the banks the way we are today. I know you don't want to change anything, but we're going to keep taking these antitrust cases and it's going to be very time consuming and expensive. And so it's in your business uh, interest banks, whether you're big or small, to allow Visa to become independent from you so that you are only our customers allow us to go public, you'll make a ton of money um, and you'll be in a antitrust safe zone. And I remember this gentleman named Jim Wells who was the CEO of I think um, South Trust at the time. He'd always talk about the ticking clock, the ticking clock, we gotta do this because of the ticking clock. And so after about a year and a half, um, the US board agreed to going independent going public. And then I remember we had this meeting in Hampshire, England, where my boss at the time, Carl Pascarella said, I don't wanna tell them this, Josh, you tell them this. And I stood up in front of bankers from all over the world and, and said, look, we gotta to come together as a company, we gotta go public. And literally there were cat calls and boos and you know, you're just a lawyer, what do you mean, blah, blah, blah. And so it took us another year and a half before we finally um, made the move um, to uh, consolidate as an entity and to go public. And I tell you, I don't think it would have happened unless you, Noah, were doing the exact same thing, slightly different circumstances. MasterCard wasn't as defederated as we were, I think you were a little more centralized but I'm sure your task was equally difficult. But because we had common customers and owners and they said, hey, Josh, we don't like this thing. We're gonna to go to MasterCard. Well, wait a minute, MasterCard's doing the same thing. And so even though Noah and I did not collaborate on this part, this probably would have been quite inappropriate, the fact that we were both doing it in parallel made it that much easier. And so, um, I think MasterCard beat us to the punch a little bit um, and, uh, and went public first. We did things a little bit differently where we figured out a way to um, pay off the legacy litigation through the banks, ownership interest in Visa. But the point is we both got to the same place and became separate uh, entities for antitrust purposes, which really did improve the battleground for us in these continuing interchange cases. You know, it's interesting, Josh, to hear you tell this story because I'm not sure some of, some of those details we had discussed before, and it's, it's kind of shockingly similar to what I went through. Um, I think we were, I think we beat you by about a year and a half. Yep. Uh, and um, what 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 we really had to do, and frankly, the biggest challenge was the American directors understood the exposure. They knew that we had to figure out a way to go public. But MasterCard was owned by financial institutions around the world, and the board was primarily you know, uh, governed by non-US directors. So our task was to uh, convince all of the directors that we, we, needed, we, we, need, we needed to go public. And, and by the way, Richard Davis is now on the MasterCard board, Josh. I'm not sure if you, if you know that. But, but that's uh, what I was trying to think of earlier today. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, a couple of really interesting, and I'll tell this really quick, uh, uh, quickly, so we, we can get into some of the, you know, some of the areas of of collaboration. But um, what I learned from that experience was, um, and I'll never forget this because I may, I went back and forth to Europe many many times. The first time I went, I gave a speech. And it was a similar reaction, uh, a, a lot of consternation. 
Uh, and um, one of the directors, one of the European directors sat down and he said to me, you know, Europeans are different than Americans. You can't fly in here and think you can. You have to come back, have tea with them, talk about it and come back again and again. And that is precisely what I did. And we ended up having a unanimous vote supporting the, the, uh, the IPO. But the, the ultimate compromise, and you know, folks that know the industry know about this, was the Europeans were very concerned about the US shareholders controlling the company, changing the business of the company. Well, not an illegitimate concern. So they didn't want the public shareholders to have more than 49%. So we ended up with a structure where the public had 49%, the banks retained 41%, and 10% as a compromise went to a public foundation, um, goodwill uh, and uh, a third party that had an interest in um, you know, maintaining the brand because they had to keep their shares for a certain number of years. That turned out to be, and, and they wanted it, we had to find a jurisdiction that wasn't the US, so we ended up in Canada. And now the Mascot Foundation, I think, is the biggest foundation in Canada and one of the top five, I think, in the world, based on that kind of just notion of a compromise to get the deal done. Uh, so in, interesting how both um, both uh, organizations got to the same place. Um, we, we think we the reason one of the reasons we're telling this story, in addition to, to the fact that we love telling stories about our our our, our successes. Uh, we, we, we don't dwell on the billion dollar payments to settle cases because that wasn't as much fun. But, but I, I would say that, um, you know, because we are two companies facing a very competitive industry in challenging times, I think it, the natural inclination, especially with the antitrust concerns, would be to avoid any cooperation. And we could have taken, I think, what I described as the traditional approach, um, but we opted to develop a relationship of trust um, over the years, sensitive to the antitrust uh, restraints, and you know, no one should be, no one should be fooled. You know, we had our share of battles. Our organizations were intensely competitive, uh, but I think let let's let's talk a little bit more, Josh, about how our relationship of trust evolved over time. Maybe um, speaking of you know battles that we had, we did have a a major battle concerning Visa's um, anti-competitive settlement service fee. I'm sorry, I'm just kidding. Well, kind of kidding. But Visa's um, fee after the uh, the Walmart case that you mentioned. So maybe talk a little bit about that, and then you know maybe discuss a little bit kind of how our relationship evolved over time. Sure. No, I I believe one of the first times we talked, you called it that silly little fee. <laughs> Um, which was a fee that, that uh, frankly, I inherited a, a, along with the, the earlier Walmart $2 billion settlement that I mentioned. And what, um, what Visa had decided to do was to recoup the $2 billion from its members, because remember, at the time, Visa was nothing more than a membership association. So all the profits save a little bit for salaries and so forth and all the obligations flowed through the entity to the member banks and so the idea was that the that if a bank were to say geez i don't want to um i don't want to pay my share of the walmart obligation to visa because visa had constructed this this system I'm just going to leave and go to MasterCard. And our rule said, well, if you do that, you got to pay this settlement service fee. So MasterCard obviously didn't like that. Um, and um, so we had a, a contentious issue that could have gone the way of other matters where we just litigated in court. Noah and I would see each other once a year in court and otherwise really just um, not have a relationship and just battle over this fee. But instead, we decided to mediate um, and, and we resolved it. And we resolved it in a way that I think was very favorable to both of us. I remember being on a, a, our, our plane flying, I think we were going to Russia and we were over Estonia. 
and I'm explaining to my boss, Joe Saunders, how paying MasterCard for the settlement service fee is actually a great thing because we also tied in a number of other potential issues that we had and we settled all of them together for a certain amount. And I'm explaining to my boss how paying multiple millions of dollars was really a good thing. Well, he started screaming at me so loud, I started looking out the window to see if there might be a small hamlet or something I could jump out of with a parachute and land on. And there was just nothing, no people, just ice. But anyway, um, my boss came to understand that I thought it was a good deal. But I think the best thing that came out of it was Noah and I really started to have a relationship where instead of looking for controversy, we looked for solutions. Instead of you know, looking to, to one up each other, um, we developed a relationship where we kind of were rowing in the same direction on a variety of issues. And we'll explain more about that as, as this uh, webinar proceeds. But I think it really put us in, in good stead. And I can contrast that to the relationship that at least I had um, with Discover's general counsel and with American Express's general counsel. And although those companies were structured differently from Visa and MasterCard, you know, litigation is litigation, antitrust um, disputes are antitrust disputes. And we never developed that kind of relationship. And I think it actually inured to the benefit of Visa and MasterCard that we had those relationships and I think, you know, the proof's in the pudding, how these two organizations have really, really thrived. I'm not going to say our competitors didn't, but I'm going to say we thrived a little more. Yeah, Josh, I think, I think you have it right. I, I completely agree. And, you know, just, just to give everyone a sense of kind of what we work through, the relationship between Visa and MasterCard, and in particular the legal departments, were terrible before Josh came. Just as one quick example, MasterCard and Visa had a joint uh, legislative group where we de dealt with non-competitive, just purely legislative issue issues that adversely impacted or could impact the financial institution customers that we had jointly. To make a very long and painful story short, we had the, I won't mention the law firm, but we had the same law firm. And then uh, I will never forget this because I was driving in my car and I got a call from the partner who ran this thing and said, we can no longer represent uh, your firm, even though you hired us first, Visa gives us more business. So we no longer can represent MasterCard after next week. I, I was fired by a law firm, never thought that would happen ever. And uh, naturally I was angry and we, you know, we, we looked at potential legal action. We ended up actually deciding to hire the partner at the law firm under, you know, um, and, and move, move him to another, another law firm with a, a few other folks. And so we had kind of our, our share of revenge there. But it really, it really, it gives you a flavor about how much animus there was between the organizations. And then we um, shortly followed that by having both myself and the then general counsel testifying before the Senate Banking Relations Committee. And uh, we were up against the two CEOs from American Express and Discover. And we did fine. I thought we actually you know, made a good argument and the CEOs were not as knowledgeable about the legal issues. But frankly, if it was Josh and I, we would have been able to coordinate and would not have repeated some of the same arguments. It just would have been a much more effective presentation. So um, I think, um, um, you know, as Josh said, we really, um, we, we really evolved. And then um, the next industry battle involved legislation uh, concerning the regulation of debit card fees. And there, there was ongoing efforts to um, regulate, you know, the interchange fees, whether for credit and debit. And uh, Senator Durbin actually threw a grenade and actually, um, uh, push this legislation forward. And I think, uh, Josh, maybe uh, uh, talk a little bit to, uh, about how we work together appropriately on opposing that legislation. Sure, no. Um, the Dodd-Frank legislative effort with, with Durbin's amendment um, 
is an area where, you know, under North Pennington and the antitrust laws, you know, it, it's safe um, to collaborate, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in the past we would have collaborated, but we did this time. Um, and we also did in a lot of other antitrust safe areas, which I think just enhanced the relationship, not only between Noah and myself, but between other people in our uh, respective legal departments and also sort of imbued the cultural normalcy of working together with MasterCard. So um, with the uh, Durbin Amendment, we, our lobbyists would coordinate. We would talk about you know, which legislators we would speak with, what arguments we would make. Um, and we did the same thing in another in a number of other contexts. There's the something called the Financial Services Roundtable, where we get together and we speak about uh, industry issues. Um, EMV Co is a is a organization that includes Visa, Mastercard, and also uh, other payment systems: China Union Pay, American Express, Discover, where we talk about and and uh, promulgate standards on interoperability so that, you know, one payment card is gonna work at a merchant regardless of whose chip is in it. So people have confidence and certainty in the, in the use of, of plastic. Um, a number of other uh, areas where we would collaborate, but uh, with Dodd-Frank, um, unfortunately the, um, the debit interchange regulation passed and, and uh, we thought it was ill-advised, um, but we did end up solidifying those relationships between our companies and also educating legislators about the harmful effects of price regulation. And so I think that put us in good stead. It, it warded off a number of other efforts to regulate on the credit side and other aspects of uh, the way that Visa and MasterCard um, do business. And I think that the, the collaboration uh, continues to this day. You know, you know one of the um, things that we're going to get into when we talk about um, uh, cooperation on the, the more recent uh, litigation, uh, the level of legal cooperation, I think it relates to the legislative work as well. And, and that is, Josh, I'm sure you'd agree that you know, we were actually um, working with the same major financial institutions, uh, opposing the legislation, the joint defense in terms of the litigation. And most of them were excellent folks, you know, really good lawyers, uh, but not all of them. Some of them could be very difficult. And their financial institutions all had different perspectives. So if we were not reasonably aligned, you know, it really would have been difficult to control such a group. But I think, I think it really made a difference that we were visible. It was visible to all these financial institutions that we were working together. And, uh, you know, we, we were able, I think, to, you know, better coordinate as we dealt with some of those challenges. And as a matter of fact, I think, you know, we, you know, because we developed frankly, a, a friendship, we could talk about the personality challenges that we faced. You know, there are some outside counsel that might have been a tad egotistical and we would, you know, joke about it and then strategize how to deal with that to make sure that we got the group to come out in the right place. I agree, Noah. And um, when the second round of interchange cases were filed and we had changed our structure and gone public in the in the interim, I think literally every major law firm in the country was involved representing one of the associations, one of the merchant groups, or one of the financial institutions. And so in the giant multi-district litigation case before Judge John Gleason in Brooklyn, um, it could have been chaos. And uh, Everyone could have been asserting their own interests and trying to outmaneuver 
some of the other people, which is sort of what happened in the earlier cases where American Express and Discover were involved. But in the consolidated merchant litigation, you and I took a very different course, didn't we? We, we uh, spent many, many months working with the lead lawyers from these prestigious law firms around the country to come up with a joint defense agreement, which um, talked about not only how we would settle the case and what kind of permissions would be needed and what kind of notices would be required, but also how we would conduct ourselves. And I think that we had, not only did you and I have a good relationship, but I think our outside counsel did. Our, our lead lawyers couldn't have been more different from one another, um, but they both brought really good things to the table and they developed good working relationships with the merchants lawyers and with the court. And it really um, inured to our benefit. And um, I think it helped tremendously in not disrupting our businesses while we work through a solution um, to these continuing interchange cases. And I think once we set the model in that case, um, you know, it, it, it's continued in, in those areas where we're both parties to the same lawsuits. And I, I think it's a good way to go. And I'd recommend it to this group to consider if they ever find themselves in a similar situation. Yeah, and, and Josh, I'm sure you would agree that it really wasn't easy. I mean, we had to negotiate settlement and judgment sharing agreements between ourselves and then with the banks. And there was a level of complexity, which um, actually reminds me of, a, of an amusing uh, story that we had. So jo Josh and I you know, had a lot of back and forth uh, arguing essentially about what percentage of any settlement Visa would bear. My argument was that Visa was a lot bigger than, than MasterCard and other arguments that won't go into the level of detail, but that therefore Visa should have a much higher percentage of any legal settlement. You know, Josh, I think probably started with, you know, the two of us with joint defendants should be 50-50. And we negotiated for a long time. And uh, we were, I think, pretty close to resolving it when we had dinner, I think it was in New York, Josh, and the, the check came. And I think Josh said, should we just split it? I said, no, I think you should pay 60.4% of the bill. <laughs> and, the, and we laughed and that, that became, um, and, and again, it, it like, like, like you would expect, it lightened the mood and you know, contributed to um, what was already like a, a, a very uh, affable um, um, relationship. So um, I, I actually want to, Mention the audience. We we don't. I haven't seen any questions. So if anyone has any questions for us, you know, please feel free to shoot them our, our way. Please do. Uh, so, you know, Josh, let's talk about. I don't want to say the elephant in the room, but the 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 antitrust challenge. I mean, uh, I I think you know people might be gun shy about you know being too cozy with competitors from a relationship point of view. How did you get your head around that? Well, it's certainly true that um, because we were competitors and because we had common customers um, and because we were setting the prices that our customers would uh, uh, pay one another, um, there was a lot of antitrust sensitivity. And of course, you know, the proofs in the pudding, there was a lot of antitrust litigation. So it's understandable, I think, um, to say, hey, I'm just gonna play it completely safe and I'm not even gonna talk to this other guy because I don't wanna end up being subpoenaed uh, and I don't want my CEO to end up being subpoenaed. But if you look beyond the superficial, um, there's just so much advantage to cooperation as long as you're careful. And I guess I felt comfortable because I do have an antitrust background that I would um, not stray uh, too close to the line. 
But I'm curious, Noah, be, uh, whether you had the same confidence because um, you came from a criminal defense background, how did you navigate that to feel that you were comfortable speaking with me? Well, that's a that's that's a good question because uh, you know I I had kind of antitrust on the job training, so so to speak. Uh, but I, a couple of things. One is uh, uh, Paul Weiss. Uh, Ken Gallo was our lead counsel. Uh, he's a fabulously talented attorney, and Paul Weiss obviously has deep antitrust experience. And I had them on speed dial on my phone. So I knew that I had a place to go, but I think equally, if not more important, I always hired people that were smarter than me. And so I had really talented antitrust in-house counsel, you know, that would, um, you know, be uh, great, great to lean on. But finally, I think in, 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 as long as you know enough, I think about the antitrust laws and have judgment, I think, you know, some of this is to an extent common sense. Um, uh, there was a question uh, on the on the chat about um, the reaction of our executive teams to the level of um, um, the, the the quality of our relationship and the level of interaction. Did you did you have any pushback from you, from your guys in terms of our relationship? Well, in in uh, just a few short years at Visa. We had three different CEOs. We, um, we st uh, I was hired by Carl Pascarella, who's a great guy at, at uh, Visa USA, and then, then we had John Coglin briefly, and then, uh, and then Joe Saunders. So the CEOs were either used to the old ways or brand new to the job. And I think with Carl, um, he felt it was a breath of fresh air. Um, because I, I, I gave him confidence that this was okay and showed him sort of a path to solution that hadn't been available before um, with, my, with my predecessor, who was a great lawyer and a wonderful guy, but had a different way of approaching Noah and others. Um, so the latter two CEOs were, uh, as I say, new to the job, willing to trust me. And so, no, I didn't get a whole lot of internal pushback, but I assured them I was being very careful. Uh, I How about say, you? I would say my experience was pretty much the same. You know, I think it was generally supportive. I, I don't remember any kind of mistrust. I, I think there was a kind of a realization that it was an advantage uh, to the company. Um, we, we, we have a, a, a really uh, good uh, uh, question from David Yaman on, on the, uh, um, the Q&A, which is whether we ever had a situation where business clients or peers were in discussions with each other and ventured into discussion that triggered antitrust concerns. If so, how did we handle and what are some basic watch outs to provide clients on how to navigate those discussions? I you go ahead, Josh, then I'll throw my two cents in. Well, I, I think that part of the art, uh, if you will, is to anticipate those things in advance. So, you know, there were, there were some people at Visa that I had more concerns about than others, quite, quite honestly. And um, when they were going to a forum where there was going to be a, a senior person for MasterCard, where I thought there may be... Um, some issues, I would either spend a whole lot of time with them or one of the very capable lawyers on my team would to try to avoid any problems uh, prophylactically. And as I sit here today, I can't remember ever having to cut someone off or turn off their microphone uh, because we had done our prep. How, how about you, Noah? Well, you know, I can recall situations where Clients wanted to do stuff, actually, you know, quite often that would kind of trigger an antitrust concern. But I think we had the kind of culture where the business knew they had to go through the law department. So we we're able to cut off any kind of concerning behavior. One quick funny uh, story about that related to um, 
some of the communication between our business guys, the sales guys, and the financial institutions. And Josh, you may remember this infamous email because it came up in litigation. Uh, there was a concern raised by our guy about something the one of the banks was asking for, and the business person from the bank wrote back, F the DOJ. <laughs> And the Department of Justice, and you can you can you can imagine the reaction to that once that came out in discovery. But um, you know, I, I think um, the sensitivity on the part of our organization, thanks in large part to Bob Sealander, who was the CEO, and was you know very deep, even though he was an engineer by background, had a real strong legal sensitivity, and he made sure that everyone knew that. Uh, there would be hell to pay if you cross the line. So I think we were um, we, we were fortunate in having that kind of uh, culture, I think. No, I see there's a question about how to get uh, the basics on antitrust if you don't have an in-house lawyer or you don't have the budget to, to hire uh, outside counsel on an ongoing basis. You know, th this is one where I would suggest rather than trying to read treatises and so forth that you do hire just for a few hours, a good antitrust lawyer who can talk about your particular industry and give you the outlines of the, of the do's and don'ts. Cause it's really gonna depend on what industry you're in, what the competitive landscape looks like, what the case law is. And so, uh, yeah, if someone ever wants to get a hold of me online, I can give you some names, but there's lots of good antitrust lawyers out there. Get a lay of the land. And if you end up um, in more of a competitive environment than you thought with stickier issues, you know, you may need some budget to bring someone in house. Uh, Josh, we, we, I know when we went over this, we, we, there's tons more areas that we could cover, but I want to make sure we don't miss one. Um, and, and that is, I mean, we dealt with issues like China. China had, um, and still does, um, does limit the um, credit card companies in terms of doing business there. Uh, the United States uh, trade, uh, um, the USDR brought a, brought a lawsuit against China, asked going to be to work with them. Uh, it's a good example. We were competing against each other for customers in China at the same time we were working together to see if we can get um, you know, the, um, the um, competitive, the landscape opened up to um, uh, the US companies. Uh, but I wanna bring it to today and, and talk a little bit about, about Russia and Ukraine, because I don't think either one of us have knowledge about how the companies dealt with that situation. But uh, so we can talk about what we would have done and how we would have handled the situation of doing business in Russia and suddenly being confronted with a situation where both companies have many employees all over Russia, significant business for both organizations. And we might have handled that, particularly focusing on what level of communication and coordination we, we, we might have undertaken. Yeah, and no, I think this is a great example of when you have the relationship like you and I have, um, you can act in a certain way, kind of predicting that your counterpart's going to act in a similar way because we have the same values and we kind of know what's going on. A, 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 a smaller example when we, you and I were at the helm was, you know, when Assange, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks was uh, posting all of the, uh, the military secrets. I, I think Visa and MasterCard both decided to uh, terminate uh, WikiLeaks as, as a merchant, at least temporarily. We didn't get together and say, hey, I'll do it if you do it, because that would be potentially a boycott and an antitrust violation. But because, again, at least I was comfortable that MasterCard would probably act the same way because this was harmful to, to US security interests, et cetera, we could act knowing that we wouldn't be put at a competitive disadvantage. And flash forward today to Russia, 
I think it's the same thing. Now, I didn't make the decision because I'm no longer general counsel, but um, you know, here you have an act of aggression uh, uh, by Russia, uh, uh, you know, the, the terrible uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and the, you look at the sanctions that are being put uh, on by the US government, and you know that companies in a way, and it's interesting, I had lunch just, just uh, two days ago with the guy who used to run uh, Russia government relations for us, Dmitry Vishnikov, and we were, we were reminiscing about our trip to Yalta and amazing things that happened. Um, but he was saying, you know, the, the uh, acts taken by the US companies have a much bigger effect on Russia than these government sanctions. Uh, he happens to work for Nike now, and Nike's no longer, you know, selling shoes or something in Russia. But um, if Visa and MasterCard had said, hey, let's not do business with X Bank, Y Bank, and Z Bank in Russia, and let's not do business with A Merchant, B Merchant, and C Merchant in Russia, that would probably be an antitrust issue. But instead, the idea that in this territory, we are not gonna conduct business as usual because we think it's the moral thing to do, the just thing to do for the people of Ukraine and for frankly, the people of Russia, that's not an antitrust problem. So um, again, knowing how each other might behave, knowing we have similar morals, you can make decisions in what's called conscious parallelism and not get in trouble in the antitrust courts. Yeah, I 100% agree, Josh. And, and I, I think um, one of the things we probably would have talked about is how do we protect our employees in Ukraine? You know, how do we protect our employees in, in, in Russia? Like, you know, what are the kinds of things that you're thinking about? And, and that general um, communication, I think, that we were comfortable having, you know, that frankly didn't raise anti, wouldn't raise antitrust concerns. But if you didn't have that level of trust and respect, you, you just wouldn't go there. So I, 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 think, I think that's important. You know, I, I think the message that we wanna leave is the fact that there are, you know, there are just many, many benefits that, a company, that companies can actually attain by having a, a strong relationship between the general counsels. And as Josh, I think said, it does permeate through the company and the department. We talked about the fact that um, the GC is the right person, we think, to have this kind of interaction because you know, we understand the, the, the boundaries of the antitrust laws. We know not to go too close to the line. And you know, candidly, few business people would have that awareness and sensitivity. So lots of benefits that I think can be can be realized by um, achieving what I think, Josh, that you and I achieved. I agree, Noah. That actually was the perfect way to finish this, uh, Noah. I love that idea that the GC has that insight that others wouldn't have and can, can have that balance that relationship without bringing uh, the companies into trouble. So that's fantastic. What, a, what an amazing conversation. Thank you, Josh, for joining us as our guest today. Of course, Noah always is uh, full of great stories. My favorite story was splitting the check at dinner. That, that, was, the, that was amazing. <laughs> kind of made everybody put, put it all into perspective for me. So I will say thank you to everyone. Again, this, com this meeting is going to be uh, recorded and put on our website. Um, we, um, we, we appreciate everyone coming in. If anyone has any insight for future meetings or looking for support from an advisor standpoint from Noah, um, he's uh, just such a wealth of information. Um, the, the other comment, of course, is if anybody's looking to partner with a firm for any type of strategic hire being made or um, looking for some advice regarding compensation, diversity issues or anything like that, we're always happy to help. So, and if anyone's personally considering a change and wants to know the, the get it, kick the tires and see what the market looks like, we're very happy to have those conversations as well. So thank you again, everyone. Appreciate you coming. Uh, look forward to seeing you next month. Bye everyone.